Definitely don't have one. <laughs> I don't have All right, we're recording. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, my name is Gary McCallicker, and I'm super excited uh, speaking with Dr. Brian Mann with the University of Miami uh, Kinesiology Department. Also, um, very knowledgeable about uh, velocity-based training. And so, what we were hoping to do is just get a couple quick insights on ways that we could effectively implement this with high school athletes. So, uh, Dr. Mann, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, my pleasure. So I know you're speaking at the, uh, the national conference coming up in July for the NSCA. Um, any, like, any overarching information you might wanna share with a high school coach who's interested in, in, in adopting a velocity-based approach? Well, I mean, the number one thing is that just because it's sexy doesn't mean it's something that you have to do, right? Uh, you know, the, the way that I have ended like every talk with VBT is that to say that you, you know, VBT is a nice to have, it's not a need to have, right? Mm -hmm. I go back to uh, it, this analogy, it'll take a minute to, to come around to, but whenever I was, God, I was it's a long time ago, I think I was 20, it was 2003, right? Whatever, however old I would have been there, 23, I think. I uh, drove from my mom's house in Springfield, Missouri, to 18th and Indian School Road. I don't know if it was Street or Avenue or what, but it was 18th and Indian School Road in Phoenix, Arizona to stay with my great uncle uh, to do an internship at Arizona State. So then I also had to map out that and realize that 2003, this is whenever, a, you know, the GPS that we all have on our phone now, well, those things used to be 500 bucks or a thousand bucks uh, to, you know, throw in your car and, and go with it. And you, you remember that as a- uh, Sure. Uh, well, I was able to get from Springfield, Missouri to you know, 18th and Indian School World with a McNally's Atlas. People have been using maps for millennia, right? They, if you know where you are, what's around you, where you're trying to go, you have some way to orient yourself. A map is an extremely effective means of getting where you're trying to go. But now, as I mentioned, we've got this thing called GPS, and uh, my wife's stepdad is uh, an amazing person. He's actually one of the people that uh, used GPS for planes and automated the landings and things like that. Uh, definitely on the spectrum. If you ask him what time it is, he'll tell you how the, the watch was made. But uh, from him, I know that within three feet with GPS, I am, or uh, 18 inches with GLONASS, and that's just a different a satellite server, the GPS system in the US uses three satellites and uh, uh, GLONASS uses like five or six for their triangulation. So that's why it increases the accuracy of more satellites. I know where within, you know, 18, uh, three feet where I'm at any point in time. Uh, shoot, with how the, the updates are now, I know exactly what's around me. I know if there's a gas station up ahead, if there's a wreck, if there's a cop, you know, everything, where to turn. I don't have to know anything other than what my destination is to enter that into my GPS and I will get to that exact location. Just like that, coaches for centuries, really, I mean, we go back to the ancient Greek games, they were writing programs like a map using what they knew and what they had and a lot of the things they could just see with their eyeball. Well, VBT is GPS. It tells, the, tells you exactly where the athlete is on that given day. If you've got a good coach's eye, you don't necessarily need it. Uh, for some things you would, if you wanted to look at velocity loss and things like that, if you wanted to bring some precision to it. But VBT is a nice to have, it's not a need to have. Now, what do you need to have first? Well, you need to be in shape enough to train and be able to recover from each training session. You need to be mobile enough to get into the basic positions right, that are going to be demanded for the sport, of course, and then uh, for whatever exercise that you have, you know, if, if let's say it's a front squat, well, you damn well better have good mobile lats to allow the elbows to get up into the appropriate position, wrist flexibility. For some reason, people always go to wrist flexibility for the clean, and it, a lot of times I've seen it's actually more lat, because the lat mm -hmm. is actually the uh, uh, what is it, the extension muscle. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, too. Yeah, 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 a little bit, yeah. Um, you know, so then uh, you've got, uh, you know, you got to make sure you've got those and then strength. Uh, you know, if you aren't strong, you don't need VBT. You need to work on getting strong. Uh, and how strong is strong enough? 
uh, you know, I would say that before you go to VBT, like a, a back squat should be at least one and a half times body weight. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, because you're going to get more bang for your buck on the strength end of the spectrum. I mean, you go back to a uh, guy, what is his name? Um, he's got glasses that look like these, bald, been around forever. Theories and methodologies of periodization was the first one, his orange cover. And now he's writing with Carlo Buzicelli. Um, Jesus Christ, where is it at? Bampa, Tudor Bampa. Uh, he said uh, many times in his books and then uh, and, and some of the, I've seen him speak once. I've only seen him speak once. I, be, I don't know where he lives, but he's getting up there in years. So there's probably a reason for that. Uh, he said that all strengths relate back to absolute strength, at least for a while. Right. And it's not until that while ends, you know, that really that uh, it's like where to strengthen on its uh, transfer about 2.2 times body weight. Right. Uh, so people say, well, there's nothing on that. There's nothing on that, dude. Look at uh, there's a paper from Sucumel, Nymphius and Stone. It's the one that they can that Tim considers the first in the uh, series that they show. It's 2.2 times body weight is the end of where the transfer starts to happen. And then you can work on all the other cool shit at that point. So I don't think that you need to really work on it until, you know, if somebody can barely squat the barbell, why are you going to have them do BBT? Yeah. You know, and even in the college environment where, you know, and, and this is something that I think I, I vary a little bit from Dan, uh, Dan Baker on, is that I don't give everybody VBT. I only give the people that, uh, that need it VBT. The, and that actually beyond need it, they need it and they earned it. Now, what do I mean by that is that yeah. I don't have to, you know, with V, any time that you give somebody out of regulatory mechanisms or training, they can dog it, Right. Uh, if it's APRE, whatever, they know how they, they can dog it. They can cheat the system so they don't have to work. I'm not going to give that dude VBT. And if I give it to him and he dogs it, I'm busting his ass back in uh, level. Sorry about that. I, uh, uh, the, the caffeine has not kicked in yet. So my filter isn't. Up, I saw, uh, I saw the switch and I saw the, I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. <laughs> it happens. Yep. Uh, yeah. I still get fired up, you know, I, uh, while Love I'm not actively coaching now, I think it's been three years since I've had a team uh, and I miss it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm better off on the sports science side of things. Yeah. So that's what I do here for UM for the athletics. I don't coach anybody, but I'll do a lot of the sports science type things for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so it's not until they get strong enough that they, that they're actually going to benefit from it, man. Uh, so it, it, it's kind of like pissing in the fan. It don't make no sense. Uh, you know, get them, get them mobile, get them strong, get them in shape, and then worry about the velocity of the spectrum at the, at the end. Uh, you know, so that's, that's, that's where it's at. And uh, really, you know, there's a force velocity continuum for a reason. And, uh, you know, we don't need to worry about the velocity of the spectrum until we develop the force end. Why? Well, because the force end takes so much longer. The velocity end is a, a neural aspect. I mean, we'll have pretty significant increases in a month. Well, in a month, yeah, you might move up a little bit, uh, but on your beyond a beginner and beyond just getting back after a break. Yeah, okay. you might move up in a little bit after a month of training heavy, but it's really going to take eight to 12 weeks because you've got to have all those, my, the myofibril has to restructure. Doesn't happen that way. It's just rate coding with VBT. And I guess we need to get back to this also as to why it's important, right? You know, so training adaptations the way that I view it really occurs in one of four things, four areas. And we could even add a fifth in, uh, remind me about the fifth and the fascia at this, at the end. Okay. All uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I haven't ever actually gone into the fifth, uh, in a while, uh, or maybe ever, but, um, but the first, so we'll break it into two that are straight, I guess you would say mechanical and two that are straight, you know, nervous system, like a, a freaking like computer, I guess you would say. And the first is the myofibrillar adaptations, right? So what happens whenever you start strength training, you increase the heavy chain myosin, you increase the thickness of it. Now, uh, with that, if you get a bigger and heavier and thicker myosin, well, then it can you know, pull harder on that actin to pull it across it. So there's that. Uh, in addition to that, we can increase the strength of the uh, myosin neck. Uh, it, because that's really, you know, people talk about the eccentric and it's really withstanding forces and mm -hmm. that will, uh, it's the, uh, so the myosin neck, uh, will, it's got a little spring to it. So then it stiffens that spring up essentially. Right. And then the tighten and things that would happen as well. 
Uh, but that's because of the Elast, and that's, the, the, we, that's not a rabbit hole we need to go down. Nobody <laughs> gives two shits about that. Uh, but along with that, increasing the heavy chain myosin, one of the areas that people really got to understand, and I go into this pretty deeply in that uh, Strength Coach Network uh, course uh, on the physiology of it, is uh, the penation angle, right? So if I make each fiber thicker, it's coming into the tendon at the same point. So it's going to be coming in less parallel and more perpendicular. Now, why does that matter? Well, the more perpendicular it comes in, the more goes towards the more force, the more muscular tension goes towards rotary torque and less towards compression or distraction. Now, that's good and bad, right? It's good because if I got more rotary torque, that means I've got more force that's moving my lever, moving my bone. So then it can potentially do so faster. Uh, could it be a bad thing? Well, yeah, if I produce way too much rotary torque and I haven't uh, strengthened up the tendons and uh, to the point where it can handle it, something's going to give at some point, right? Uh, then let's go on to, hmm, where should we go next? Well, let's go, let's go to, uh, let's go to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? Now the sarcoplasmic reticulum, if you remember from physiology and guys, I, I want to go ahead and say this. I was a education school and counseling psychology major. So this shit is tough. I get it. You know, for, for a lot of us who are, you know, not actually, you know, who are all self-taught in this, it, it gets pretty deep into the weeds sometimes. So um, just, just bear with me. If, you, if there's something that you don't know, I'll try and explain it. So for a muscle fiber to contract, right, that we just talked about that myosin and actin, we have to have calcium. And calcium enter, is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and uh, it goes out and it bathes the muscle fiber, and it gets onto this, uh, was that the troponin C? Yeah, man, I'm still a little messed up. So I had, you know, surgery a couple of weeks ago, and I'm still a little slow. I think the uh, the opiates have not completely left my system yet, maybe, or it's just that I'm getting older. I'm not sure. Uh, but the uh, the calcium goes on to the troponin C, which moves the troponin, which gives the moves the tropomyosin to make an active binding site for the myosin to grab a hold of for that sliding filament theory to occur. And it's that calcium that's responsible for that muscle contraction. So if there's no calcium, there's no cascade, and there's no movement. Okay, so. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is what is in charge of how fast the, the um, muscle fiber can contract. Well, if we need to speed things up to move faster, we need a faster acting sarcoplasmic reticulum. What happens pretty quick. So you've got to move super, super duper fast for you to be able to improve that. And the only way to do that is sprinting. Oh, myosin uh, heavy chain in the myofibrillar adaptations. How is that typically done? Oh, somewhere between 60 and 80% of 1RM. Uh, and you can go up to failure, you can stop a rep or two short, but you've still got to have progressive overload, right? That's how you develop that. For the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's sprinting. Uh, let's see, where do we want to go next? Uh, let's go to Hinneman size principle. Okay, Hinneman size principle, you remember that's the uh, high threshold motor units, right? Being able to access that. And, uh, you know, that's the, those are the motor units that you always hear about the uh, car falls on the toddler and the mom flips the car over, right? Well, that's, you know, uh, it, it allows you to reach those high threshold motor units. And if you can do so in training, potentially you can do so in the uh, athletic activities. And how can you get to those high threshold motor units that you're getting a lot more force and velocity from? Uh, why are you getting more velocity? Because they're type two fibers. So they're faster contracting. Uh, you're going to do that through 90% plus of 1RM. Right, so more tired, it's like the maximum effort method, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then the last is rate coding, right? And rate coding is how fast that signal gets shot down the nervous system to initiate that calcium cascade to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You got to, uh, so the faster you can send the signal down, as long as your sarcoplasmic reticulum has, you know, some uh, leeway to it there, as long as you're not operating at max intensity, you're going to move faster and faster and faster. So how do we do that? Well, it's more with the intermediate to fast velocities. Uh, so we do that with things like VBT, ballistics, like Olympic weightlifting movements, uh, uh, in, in that sort of nature, right? And single effort jumps. So those are those four. Now we get to the fifth with the fascia, okay? And that's something that I, I typically avoid, but I think I'm getting to the point now where I, I can get it. So the fascia 
uh, the fascia is mostly collagen and it's oriented collagen. There's some sort of neural network there that I don't know. If, uh, you, man, why well, it's going to take probably another 10 to 15 years to get that figured out. I'm, I'm going to start reading some of Robert Schleip's work to, uh, to, to get to the bottom of that. Uh, he's been studying it for 25 years. So, you know, it'd be stupid not to start with him. Uh, but uh, so the collagen, it would, you know, like, let's just go with the fascia and uh, how, you know, you've got the endomesium, epimesium, and paramesium that come together and they are, surround the muscle and then they wrap together and then they are what forms the tendon. So whenever there's a stretch placed on that, then that's what can give us some of that stored elastic energy. So that's the uh, physiological component to plyometrics as opposed to the, neurophys the neural side, right? So mm -hmm. you get that neurophysiological mechanism. Well, whenever we can get a quick stretch and release, we're going to be engaging with that system. And uh, so with the fascia, it usually works better at the end range unless you've got significant pretension. And that's why plyometrics work for the fascia. And uh, most of the time though, that you've got to train fascially, you'll see that it's some weird large range of motion arcing thing. Yeah, because it's not till the end range of motion to where you start reorienting that, that fascial tissue. Why does it work otherwise for plyometrics? Because the amount of pretension you set that uh, super tight to what needs to be done. And that's how you can bounce quickly up out of the ground. Uh, some people are going to look at me and say, well, what is the stretch reflex then? The stretch reflex requires adequate pretension. Uh, otherwise, you would never have taken a misstep off of a curb or thought there was one more step and there wasn't or whatever and stumbled because the stretch reflex would have had you. That's only a, a minor part of it. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, you've got to have adequate pretension as well. Otherwise, you're screwed. Right. Um, you know, that's, that's just the way that that goes. So I tell all of those things to go back to, hey, make sure that you lift something heavy. Make sure that you jump. Make sure you sprint. Make sure that you lift repetitively. And then whenever you get through with all that and they're no longer making gains in their jumps and their sprints, then you'll make sure to start training with VBT because uh, they're already strong and have those adaptations made. So when you say like you got to make sure they earned it or need it, how did you come up with your norms? Yeah, when so that somebody's when they're ready. Yeah, uh, so there's two different ways that to really do it. If the simplest way is to look at what is their squat, right? Uh, look at their squat and look at the vertical jump. If they're squatting more than double body weight, they're not going to. I mean, yeah, you can still get them stronger, uh, but if it's a full range of motion squat you're not going to see any further benefit out of it. So you're definitely putting them on there. Mm -hmm. uh, then the, uh, the more, I guess I would say scientific, but it's not really super scientific. Uh, here's what I did, right? So if you've read Zatsiorski's, I believe it's Science and Practice of Strength Training. Uh, it's here somewhere. Which actually, it's pretty cool. Andy Fry is, uh, was added on there and he put some VBT stuff in there. So that, that's pretty slick. I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, but I was trying to think of the exact term and I was going to go look it up. It's in the first uh, chapter. Uh, explosive strength deficit, right? If you've read that book, you've seen that. And basically what they looked at was the amount of force uh, for a uh, unloaded movement, right? For explosive movement and divide that by the force from a, uh, a non-rate limited activity that's going to be, you know, force dominant. So typically he, I believe he looked at a counter movement jump and a, a stationary squat jump, which is you go down you pause, no stretch, uh, shortening cycle is activated and you explode from there. Uh, and they were looking at Watts, but you could use that for eccentric utilization ratio, et cetera. Uh, and then, uh, oh no, it was squat. He would, did, I think he used the force off of a one arm squat. Well, what I ended up doing was uh, bastardizing it. I didn't have force plates at the time. Uh, I don't know if that's a, a bad word or not. So uh, if we got to edit that out, I apologize. But um, I took the counter movement jump and I converted it into watts, right? Just so that body weight was accounted for. And I divided that by squat 1RM uh, plus uh, the uh, body mass, right? Uh, and I, yeah, that's what I did. And then I just standardized the scores. And if you were greater than positive one on the standardized score, which is a Z score and, uh, you know, Z score, if somebody's, you know, not from the U.S., uh, if they were more positive than positive one, that meant they were too explosive for how strong they were. If they were more negative than negative one, they were uh, too, uh, too strong for how explosive they were. 
So the person who was greater than plus one, you gave them a little extra strength work. The person who was more negative than negative one, you gave them extra ballistics. And that's how we made the, uh, made the decision of who to give that to. Uh, but again, if they weren't, hadn't earned our trust, we're not giving them BBT. Right. So it was something that, you know, we set it up that whenever somebody saw a Tendo or a gym aware device on a barbell, every other athlete in that weight room knew that they had earned it, that they had done something. Uh, so they wore it as a badge of honor that they were on one of the, you know, those racks. And uh, so that's how we, we worked that out. And here I am doing Buddy Morris. I think you asked one question. I've gone on for like 25 minutes. It's okay. I was, you know, so it's like, I'm sitting here trying to quote, do this interview, right? And I get, it's like when you sit and you're observing somebody, you get sucked into the lesson and you forget what you're actually supposed to be doing. That's, that just happened to me. Ah. Yeah. So anyway, let me backtrack. Um, when you talked about like the, the different types of materials, is there any material out there, uh, device that you like, um, like, to, to help with, to, to implement VBT uh, in, a, in a weight room. Like I, I can tell you years ago, probably six years ago, I started playing around with this, this app. It was called Bar Sense, right? And you could like put the little thing on the little circle on the end of your weight and then it would measure your bar path, but it would also measure like your velocity and stuff. And then I started using that in my Olympic lifting training and I, but I didn't have anything to base it on, but like they don't, they don't make that app anymore. So now, uh, like we have, we were playing around with different things in my school. Like we have a bar sensei or is there anything that, out there that you like that's kind of more cost effective for our school? Yeah. Uh, so let's go into the devices and how they work. Okay. Right. So uh, the linear position transducers. Yeah. Well, I guess what I should start with is uh, my favorite is the gym wear power tool. Hands down. Uh, is the people, what? The gym aware, you know, the power okay. tool. Uh, uh, now they've got the flex too. So I wanted to differentiate between those. Uh, it's an LPT and a linear, and it has X axis correction. A linear position transducer is super simple. It measures the distance and there's a little, it's a stopwatch and a tape measure, right? It's got a little potentiometer type thing in there that spins around and it counts how many times that spool goes around and it knows how much thread is on there for each spot. So then you multiply the number of revolutions uh, times the distance plus whatever's left over. And then, you know, what your distance is and the time is just a stopwatch that says, that, Hey, as soon as that starts moving, uh, that's when the time starts, when it stops, that's when it's over. Uh, so you just divide the distance by time and that's how you get a velocity. So it's a pretty direct ish measure of velocity. Uh, the downside for the linear position transducer is it, if somebody's not perfectly straight up and down from the unit. So with Tendo, I spent a lot of time leaning over and moving them back and forth. And that sucked, man. You know, like we had mentioned, you know, you got some herniated disc. I got four of them sons of bitches. And they would just, it was bad. Like at the end of a workout on squats, uh, my back would hurt so bad from leaning over and moving the thing so many times. But the Gym Aware and some other units now have wisened up and they've got X-axis correction. Gym Aware was the, the first. So, uh, but uh, so then that uses the, opposite over hypotenuse, the sine of the angle calculated a thousand times a second to tell you what, you know, to correct for that difference along the x-axis. So you're, while you're directly measuring the hypotenuse, you're calculating what that vertical axis would be, the y-axis. So that's why it's called an x-axis correction. And you can be off, you know, if you're 18 inches off, you're off by like 15%, right, yeah. on your velocity. So that, that's actually pretty big. Accelerometers measure acceleration, and then they use derivatives to look for distance and time for velocity. Uh, so the uh, bar path can be an issue with those and also uh, algorithm. You know, you're only as good as your algorithm is. Well, actually you're only as good of what kind of one, do you have a good accelerometer in there or do you have a cheap circus accelerometer in, in there? Uh, if it's a cheap circus accelerometer, you're gonna get absolute crap, you know, crap in, crap out. Uh, so if you have a good accelerometer in there and you've got a good algorithm, good program, you're going to be pretty all right, especially from about, man, you know, Amador Garcia Ramos did a, uh, a study where he looked at a lot of different units and the accelerometers between 60 and 80%, they were pretty, pretty money. You went lighter than that and heavier or heavier than that, then they started losing their efficacy. Uh, they're a lot cheaper though. Uh, you know, um, uh, 
Mark Hoover got me turned on to VMAX Pro. I've got one and I, I took it downstairs one day uh, before everything got bad with my uh, sinuses and head and everything. And uh, you know, any increase in pressure, I would get freaking dizzier than hell. It was, it was horrible. Uh, I haven't lifted since then yet. Hopefully, hopefully another week I'll be released for that. But the uh, VMAX Pro and it will track pretty well with the gym aware. You know, it wasn't uh, it wasn't too far off. So that was that was good. Uh, so right now that's uh, my favorite on the accelerometers. Now there's a way to use light, okay? And uh, PowerLift has done it, and uh, Gym Aware is doing it, but they're doing it differently. With PowerLift, uh, there was this thing. Uh, Bob Alejo loved it it would go onto your rack and it would attach onto the side and it would just look at the start and the end of the bar and you had to have it set in the right spot and it would give you the velocity there because it's just detecting distance and time again, just like the LPT. Uh, the, one of the benefits to it though is that, excuse me, that you didn't have to worry about the x-axis correction. You know that you, uh, if you have some light, you could have light interference though. Right, that's the downside of using a laser. The Gym Aware Flex has got a piece that goes onto the end of the barbell, and they've got a reflective surface that you can use. And it's yeah, you know, it's pretty cheap. I think it's like four. I actually have no idea how much it is, but if you use Man Five, you get a five percent discount on it or the uh, the power tool. So there's a little you know thing for the for the the members, uh, but it's going to look at the distance and divide by the time based off of the, how long the laser light takes to hit the reflective mat and come back up. Right, so think like how a bat determines distance, the sonar, kind of the same thing using a, a laser. Uh, then the last is with the camera-based systems. And what they use is a reference, and then they use their frame rate for time. And the reference will tell them the distance. Now, sometimes you'll look at, uh, I can't speak for Perch. I know a lot of people are going towards them. I've never used it. Uh, they were supposed to send me one a long time ago, but it never happened. I don't know if it's because I moved to Miami and they lost track of me or, or, or what, but uh, you, you know, like with uh, elite form, it says you stand in this spot and you do this movement. Well, they've already know what the reference distance is for that spot. So then by using that reference distance, they know that this movement of the bar equals, you know, whatever it's scaled. Maybe this, maybe, a, a you know, four millimeters in within the, frame means you know a foot and then they change use the frame rate for the time so that's how they divide out the distance and time uh, yeah the so each of them have their strengths and their weaknesses yeah the the camera base that's not as cut and dry as it is with an lpt uh lpt for me is king still because i got there's less things you can mess up right uh the more that you have to rely on algorithms and detection uh, the, the worse off that you are, the more error you can introduce. So I'm still an LPT guy. Some people think that, you know, oh, this is, this is wireless. Well, dude, bands are attached to the bar and then they, you know, they work great. So what's the difference? You know, I don't care if it's wireless or not. Uh, but those are the units. Now, the ones that I like the best, uh, VMAX Pro uh, and uh, uh, Flex in the cheap category, and then Gym Aware Power Tool. Man, I, I actually, I've never had one break on me. Uh, that was like a permanent break that I couldn't fix pretty pretty readily. Um, or, it, and I have had them maintained though. Whenever I'm at a conference, uh, I'll, I'll take in um, my stuff and uh, I've, I've got it worked out with some of the Gym Aware guys that they, uh, you know, that they had refurbished them for me. Uh, I do have a relationship with them. I don't know how much their refurbishing costs but I have had some work done to mine so that while they're old, uh, they are up to date. So, and the gym aware now, the power tool, you know, if somebody's used it before and they got pissed cause you had to stick that little needle looking thing through the hole where the cord goes through to clean it out so that it moves smooth, they get rid of that. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, that's even better. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you know if you, that was a something holding you back, yeah, go try it again. Because I know that pissed me off because I cut a couple of cords doing that, and uh, yeah, yeah, and you can you can imagine what the table area looked like with me getting mad about something like stupid like that, and uh, yeah, it was not a pretty sight. But uh, yeah, those are th those are the different units and how they work. I appreciate that. You know, I should have. I kind of went off on that because I got so sucked into what you're talking about with your five areas. Um, I kind of have a brain fart, but I, I wanted to, I apologize, but I wanted to go back to yeah. your, your application, you know, so 
goes bring it down to the squat, two times body weight strength. Um, after that, we're gonna you're gonna benefit more from working on your velocity or VBT. Um, is is that consistent for all types of athletes, or is that more athlete type specific? You know, that's a good question. Uh, that's just a general guideline, right? Uh, so, you know, if it is a sport, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just go approach it from this standpoint too, uh, that strength, how do I say this? Because I'm going to dance around in a circle here a little bit. Strength is always going to be needed uh, because it is going to be preventative of injury. If you can, if you have enough force that can turn on quickly enough, uh, you're going to be more apt to be able to keep the joint into the appropriate position and not have a rupture, right? Look at the work from uh, Hewitt, uh, Greg Myers, uh, Chris Nageli, uh, Chris, oh God, I can't remember what that blonde headed girl's name is right now. I'll think of it in a minute, but they've done a tremendous amount of work on the ACL and, you know, it's uh, in the mechanisms and countering the mechanisms. Uh, so, you know, if you're strong, you're less likely to get hurt. If you're strong, you're going to see a performance increase to a certain point. Strength isn't necessarily needed to be pushed for everybody. Now, uh, in sports where there's not a massive load to overcome, uh, once you hit that, you know, one and a half, two times body weight, there's no sense in working on it more. In fact, that uh, here, last year we had this amazing, amazing baseball team. This year was, uh, I don't know what happened. You know, I wasn't involved with the team. The, uh, this year at all. I didn't go over. Uh, COVID had everything, you know, with the restrictions and sure. and all that. So I, I can't really speak to it. There were some changes in staff. I, I, don't, I don't know. But what I do know is that last year we did a force velocity profile on the deadlift. And we had four guys that had either like, uh, you know, preseason All-Americans or newcomer, you know, anticipated newcomer of the year type guys that we had four of those all four of them on the velo unloaded movement were far greater than anybody else right if i shared the, uh, hold on let me see if i've got this readily available because uh, i think this illustrates the point documents there should be a where the fuck did that go uh hey i'm sorry about that <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah, my bad. Uh, power load, Blaine Altman. Let's see if this is it. If it's not, no. Uh, I'm just asking because, like, I was a you know I was a collegiate offensive lineman, and I might have been able to squat twice my body weight, although we didn't back squat one rep max that often. But I yeah. know a lot of the offensive linemen on that team could not squat twice their body weight, you know? Really? No. Man, we had – most of our guys at Missouri could, but we had a huge emphasis on that. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me uh, share the screen with you so then I can show you – well, this isn't even the one. Well, poop. I'm going to have to let it go right now because I don't know where the file is. But uh, the top four people, they were far away from everybody else at that velocity in the mm -hmm. spectrum. Those were our four All-Americans. And that indicates to me that, hey, what's the biggest uh, overload that you have to come over in baseball? Well, the ball's a few ounces. The bat's like two pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the biggest external loads that you really have to overcome, except for like a, the catcher who would have to pop, overcome his body weight from popping up out of the bottom to, to do a, to whatever action. So then that's more towards the velocity into the spectrum. So some sports may benefit more by training at that, you know, 30% explosively, you know, ballistically mm -hmm. than they will from, uh, you know, getting super, super strong after they have enough strength to do it. So I wouldn't start doing that until they get to one and a half times body weight because their okay. muscular, their, their, uh, their tendons, their ligaments, they're not going to be able to handle it because you're mm -hmm. going to have landing forces on there too. Unless you have, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, um, they, and that's going to be far higher than the load because we're going to have the acceleration of gravity from the top of the jump all the way down, right? So let's say somebody, you know, go back to box uh, depth jumps. Mm -hmm. If somebody's jumping off of one meter, they're hitting with uh, 10 times their body weight, 
mm -hmm. the force whenever they make contact with the ground because it's 9.81 meters per second squared. So it's, is it 10 times? Well, no, it's not 10, it's 9.81, but that's close enough to 10 for me. I'll round that crap up any, any day of the week. Uh, I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna bust that out like with a perfect calculation from your head from nine point eight one. I was like, oh shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's just, <laughs> I was like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, acceleration of gravity is nine point eight one meters per second squared. That's that's a newton, right? One kilogram yeah, yeah. is nine point eight one newtons. Uh, and there it goes out more digits than that, but I, I'm not gonna remember that. I've had too many concussions <laughs> for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I forgot where I was going. But yeah, so once somebody is strong enough, they've got enough strength. Adding more strength isn't going to do anything. Uh, so you work on maintaining their strength and probably going somewhere between 20 and 50, 20 and 40, maybe even 20 and 60%. I would start at 60% and work my way down. Uh, because 60% of what? Their weight? Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you're at 60% of one RM, there's a, there's uh, they, it was single joint versus multiple joint. So it's going, the curves are going to look different. But there's a paper from Masahiro Kaneko in 1983 that they looked at uh, curls, right? They were doing curls and they use the same apparatus that A.V. Hill used. Well, not, they didn't like get his, you know, that A.V. Hill is the guy that uh, you found that force velocity relationship and he ended up winning a Nobel Prize in physiology for it, you know, for like looking at muscle action. So they used the same setup that he did. So it was rotary and it was single joint. So it's a curvilinear relationship on the force and velocity versus if you look at J.B. Marin, well, they're using multiple joint and those multiple joints, basically your body has everything working cooperatively. So then it's a, a linear relationship. So for the people who are like, oh, well, Marin's wrong or hey, all the people before they came him are wrong. No, man, they're both right. You just didn't read the methods or you didn't think for yourself to realize that, oh, hey, multiple joints ends up making a straight line. A single joint has a curved line. Uh, but back to the point that, uh, you know, 60%, if you look at Kaneko's work is basically, I called it a Goldilocks load. It wasn't the highest power output. It was close, but it had equal improvements in the force end of the spectrum and the velocity end of the spectrum. So if we start out at 60% of 1RM and you quit seeing your jumps go up or your KPI go up, then you work more towards the velocity end of the spectrum. So you're going to decrease the percentage of 1RM, which is going to increase the velocity. I was going to ask you that too, because like, do you see like if you're if you're doing more of that level of work, do you see decay in strength numbers? Usually not, because it's not saying that you don't do strength work, okay. right? So like, uh, we might have let's say a squat day, right? I might work up to a single at eighty percent, and then you know, so it's like uh, fifty for three, sixty-five for two, seventy-five for two, eighty for one, or whatever. And then immediately from there, I'm going into my velocity work. I'm backing off and going there. Or some people will do their velocity stuff and then they'll uh, increase up and load to 80% of 1RM, right? 85%. So you can just hit mm -hmm. a couple of singles to maintain strength. It's not like you've got to do a tremendous amount of work. You just got to do enough, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and what's enough? It's not as much as some people think. I know. Uh, so here's the deal that uh, changing gears here for a second, uh, we had a stu grad student who was a strength coach at Mizzou whenever I had uh, kind of switched over it was with the, the changeover. And they had just gotten a, um, oh, my God, what, it's not an Xbox. Uh, it's a uh, PlayStation. No, 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 not a video game. It's, oh, okay. uh, no. <laughs> I was like, uh, it's uh, a it, it's inertial flywheel. It's a uh, oh, it's oh, K -box. Yeah, K -box. yeah, yeah, they're tough. Yeah, so uh, they had just got a K-Box. They're like, well, we want to see what this thing does. Uh, so we went with the stipulations of if anybody gets sore, you're done. Uh, and we only had like, you know, six guys, eight guys. Well, four of them were control, four of them were experimental. They did three sets of five, maybe three sets of eight, one time a week on the K-Box. And the eccentric decel rate of force development improved anywhere. The smallest improvement was 50%. The largest improvement was 300%. Wow. Three sets of five once a week. It doesn't take big changes to make big adaptations, mm -hmm. right? So uh, if you just add in a couple of sets for the strength on top of your VBT, if you do it before, you do it after, I don't think it matters. It's about the stimulus. How do you differentiate that between like an in-season and off-season? What do you mean? Well, like, like, do you change it up a lot uh, for the volume? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, you're going to do more uh, volume in the off season. 
uh, in season is going to be minimal. And honestly, in season, uh, this varies a little bit now from where, whenever I was full-time strength conditioning, but um, I actually go with more joint angle specificity now in season. Uh, and in the off season, I'll do the full range of motion. So like for instance, on squat, early off season, we need to, what is the first part of training? Well, it's that anatomical adaptation phase where you're supposed to lick your wounds, you know, get everything working right again. If you did mm -hmm. the FMS or something, you're trying to do the targeted work to increase the range of motion. And then it's GPP. Well, with GPP, you're trying to reestablish the strengths across the full range of motion. So I squat full squat in the off season. As we get into the preseason, we'll start looking at, uh, we'll instead of maybe like a uh, lower bar, wider stance squat, we're going to go with a higher bar and bring the feet in to shoulder width. And we're going to probably do about a half squat there. If somebody can squat deeper, great, no big deal. But we're wanting to get more towards that joint angle specificity. And then we're going to move the feet in even closer and then go to quarter squat after that with people who are well-trained. If they are weak, weaker than a kitten, uh, they're going to respond perfect to GPP. So you're just going to keep with that full squat the whole time. Uh, and then uh, from there, uh, yeah, so that's what I do. Full squat, then go to half squat, then go to quarter squat. And for a variation, we'll, we might change up with uh, bands or chains or, uh, you know, box versus uh, going to a rack or something like that. Now, will you modify the joint angle specificity? I can't say that. Um, in the in season as well with the, the VBT method? Yeah, so, um, yeah. Uh, so I'll start out with strength and then I'll go to speed. So we'll do some eights kind of heavy-ish. And then whenever uh, my KPI stops increasing, stops improving, then I'll change it to speed or I'll change the variation, change the barbell, something. A lot of times it just is change that stimulates adaptation rather than some specific thing. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of debate going on out there about that. And some people would uh, nail me up on a cross if they could uh, for saying something like that. But uh, whenever you get down to it, I mean, look at John Kiley's stuff. Man, you look at Anatoly Bondarchuk's stuff. You know, the stimulation was, uh, for the new adaptation, was a response to the change in training, not necessarily some specific exercise or percentage. Just talk to the body. Yeah. That's what I'm gonna ask you. Like, when you look at like fatigue, like levels of fatigue, do you, do you measure um, how people feel um, or I'm sure you have, uh, you know, the next day on like some type of scale, are they, are they more fatigued or more sore from a VBT training session versus like a, a normal strength session? No, actually they're usually less. And that's because we typically are looking at a velocity loss there. So there's a paper that I did with Jonathan weekly uh, where we looked at uh, like ammonia levels, right. And things like that. And basically the uh, fatigue was, you had a lower volume, lower accumulated fatigue, greater sprint, greater jump and greater strength levels from doing uh, less work. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, that's just the way that it, it goes. Uh, now on the flip side of that, there was also less muscle that's going to be put on uh, because you're not fatiguing all of the fiber, uh, the fibers, type one fibers grow too. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at a paper from Fernando Preja Blanco, can't remember the title of it, but it was in the Scandinavian journal of sports science. Uh, and they looked at 20 versus 40% velocity loss. And on average, 40% is about failure. Uh, can some people go on to 60% velocity loss? Absolutely. But I mean, we got to realize that this is, this is on average. Mm. Uh, that the group with the 40% velocity loss had a greater muscle uh, mass increase, but they didn't see improvements in speed. They didn't see as great of improvements in jumping ability. And their strength did not go up as much as the 20% loss did. Uh, which was, you know, half of the volume. Uh, so mm. it's pretty, pretty nuts. It just kind of shows that you need to stimulate, not annihilate to see speed and power adaptations. That's a great quote, actually. I can't remember. I stole that from somebody else. I don't remember who it was. Well, yeah, I'm sure you did. But I was just, yeah. hey, I've never heard it. So yeah, yeah. Well, I remember another speaker, a guy, I want to say it was Lance Walker, but I can't remember if that's actually it or not. He said, for the first three weeks, it's yours. And after that, it's mine. So that's where that <laughs> quote kind of comes from. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I always notice like when I do like explosive days or whatever days, um, I feel much more, I feel actually rejuvenated. Like I feel the opposite of sore. Yeah. Um, 
after those days. But I was just wondering, you know, for the, for the yeah, audience. there's something to it. Uh, of course, if you accumulate enough volume, it's going to you're you're going to see the opposite. You're going to shoot mm -hmm. your nervous system. You'll be down for like two weeks. Yeah. We look through. I have a list I got from. Uh, Oh, application for strength movements versus like a squat, a pull, or a press versus Olympic movements. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So the uh, the squat, squats, benches, deads use mean velocity, uh, and some people use the mean velocity for the Olympic weightlifting movements. Like I know Bo Sandoval said that he, with his Olympic lifters when he was at Michigan, that worked better for him. Uh, it seems to work better for a lot of people to use peak velocity on Olympic lifts. Um, I think it's because he was using trained Olympic lifters versus uh, a team sport athlete who, you know, Olympic lifting is GPP as opposed to SPP. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the way that I look at it there. Now with the Olympic weightlifting movements versus the squat bench deadlift, um, here's what you, here's what I would do if I was in the high school setting, the guys that needed VBT, uh, I would create a load velocity really, yeah. If they're division one, football, baseball, et cetera, just use my zones if you're using an LPT. Mm -hmm. If you're not, okay, use, uh, take your group, do the one RM, but do it with the devices on there. Look at the percentages versus the corresponding velocities and use that to create a load velocity relationship. You're probably going to be at any percentage point, plus or minus 0 0.06 meters per second. If it's more than 0 0.08, then you need to uh, bucket them, you know, the fast people and the slow people. Uh, but then, uh, so then you could use it that way. Uh, and then just relate back to your percentage of 1RM and just pull up, up the old NSCA text and be like, okay, these loads are for strength. These loads are for power. Uh, and this load is, you know, whatever. And then just use those corresponding velocities and insert that. And that's how you make up your zones. That's how I made up the zones for uh, Missouri and SMS was that exact method uh, or foot, you know, that, and that's something where, you know, the, I don't know if the curse of whatever, what it, what it would be, but um, you know, I, I put out the zones thinking that it was solid for everybody because it worked at two different institutions with multiple sports and uh, really, you know, I've got two different institutions within, you know, three hours of each other. So they're getting the same type of individual. It's division one athletes. So it's going to be a very homogenous group. So the zones came up from there. You know, you go back to the high school level, it ain't going to work that way. Because mm -hmm. how many you're just uh, you know, candidly, Gary, how many kids do you have that are going on to division one football right now? Football? Zero. Yeah. We had one kid who had a chance, but he's going division two. <laughs> so. That's, you know, so having your population using my numbers might not work out quite so well. Right. I know that Gary uh, Schofield adjusted for his guys, and I think Fred Eves did the same. So, you know, I'd recommend looking at what they had done uh, as far as those those numbers, because I don't know what they were. Uh, but, you know, football, baseball, basketball, Division One, you're good to use my numbers. Otherwise, I would just create load velocity profiles and create your own, own zones from there. Uh, what do they mm -hmm. need to work on? Go from there. Uh, velocity loss, that's easy. You know, throw 20% velocity loss on there, 10% in your set uh, for whatever the exercise is. You don't even have to change your sets, rep, um, so your sets or percentages. Instead of uh, five by four at 75%, it's uh, five sets at 75% with a 20% loss. Some sets you might get five, some sets you might get three. But the great thing about that is the fatigue stays constant. It doesn't creep mm -hmm. up as it does with uh, the traditional five by, you know, whatever, Good, mm -hmm. traditional sets and reps. Just that part right there, you, you talked about creating that load velocity um, relationship. I mean, that's money. That's, that, was, yeah. that, was, that was perfect. Yeah, and that's in, the, uh, that's in the new book, How to Do That. So that book came out, I don't remember yesterday, day before, I don't remember. So it's at uaconcepts.com. Go, I've got a step-by-step -step thing of how to do it. And I believe I even included the Excel instructions for how to create your own curves to see where power occurs at and your force and velocity so you can visualize. Uh, I threw that in there. It was uh, something that we use for the students here uh, in a, a lab class, an ex -phys lab class. Uh, so it's not perfect, but it's, you know, it, it's good enough. It gets the job done. It, get, it definitely makes the point. Any other resource? I mean, we're approaching an hour. Any other resources that you want to share that you have out there for, for people that are interested? Yeah, well, on the 15th through Stronger Experts, there's actually a 10 hour course. 
of me deep diving on everything VBT. Uh, you know, it's pretty obvious that I'm long winded. So, you know, if you've got insomnia, it would be a great, uh, great <laughs> cure for that. Uh, but you know, the fastest hour of my life. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then, you know, there's that, there's the book, uh, you know, there's my YouTube channel. Uh, you know, if you follow me on Instagram, I, I've created a, finally created a link tree. I, uh, and I've got like even a list with all the different YouTube lectures that people have, you know, filmed me doing, you know, for NSCA. I even went out and I, uh, I found some that people pirated. And uh, so they sit there and they, I don't know who does this, but they're sitting there apparently for an hour with their cell phone. I'm like, man, that sucker didn't heat up or blow up or say, you know, you got too much, you know, not enough space on this sucker. But then they, you know, so I went ahead and I even uh, included those on uh, a playlist on YouTube. But, you know, I've got a lot of resources through there. Uh, and then on the YouTube channel, I also uh, used it for double duty. If a student asked a question over study in class, I created a video for it. And if it was related to strength and conditioning in any way, I would, uh, I typically will go ahead and I'll throw that up on my channel. And uh, so then there's, you know, a lot of videos, you know, looking at more like the physiology of things, you know, the, the joint angle specificity uh, and some stuff like that. Your students are lucky. Yeah, well, sometimes uh, some of them think I'm an asshole, but, and, it, and they're right. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I do what I can. You know, a lot of this realized too, is that at Miami, most of our kids are pre-med as opposed to strength and conditioning for the undergraduate, uh, the master's level kids, uh, you know, that they're, they know what they're there for. Right. right. Uh, and, and it's more applicable, but yeah, that's, uh, that's something I try and do to keep class moving on time and still get them their information and then do something else that helps the field. So it's uh, serving multiple purposes. Well, I'll tell you what, all the resources that you have out there are really appreciative. I mean, for coaches, you know, high school, whoever it's, it's really phenomenal. We appreciate it. Well, thank you. I'm going to, uh, any last words? I'm going to stop the recording. I, this has been awesome. Honestly, it was probably the fastest hour of my life when I wrote down so many things. I don't know if I can uh, read my own writing. Yeah, well, I can't read my own writing anytime. But, uh, you know, I do have something for people is that um, be the change you wish to see in the world. Right. If you want your athletes to be a certain way, you've got to model it. You've got to do it. If you think the field needs to go in a certain way, you need to be the one who does it. I mean, I was a SIG chair for the college, you're a SIG chair for high school. You know, if we think that, I mean, the NSCA has got, I think, 61 employees serving 30, 25,000 members and something like 70,000 certificates, which means people who have a certification. That's, you know, that, that's not a good ratio. So if you think that there's something that's going wrong that needs to change, it's on you to step up and do it. You, know, you can sit there and whine all you want. And it ain't nothing going to change. All you're going to do is piss me off. Uh, I, I don't do what, you know, if anybody's been in the SIG meetings with me, I, uh, I, yeah, I'm not afraid to call a, a spade a spade. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been in too many that's like, hey, you're whining and you're complaining. You're not doing shit. So either come up with a solution or shut up. Uh, you know, so that that's my thing is, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, don't wait for your ship to come in, go build it, uh, go build the ship. Uh, the NSCA is a volunteer organization. Uh, go ahead and make sure that you're doing everything you can to help the organization. It's, you know, John F. Kennedy, uh, imagine not what you, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Well, that's, if we have that sort of insight and that sort of thought process, we're going to get a lot more from the organization. Yes, you're going to be doing more work, but you get out of it what you put into it. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's it, man. You know, get involved uh, and be the model for your students. I appreciate that because I'm, 